frozen. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to week one of Advanced Hydronics. I'm John Resso with Wells Darby. Uh, we are in our Warren, New Jersey studio. We got Eric, Chris, and Jim in the background. Uh, they'll be fielding questions. Um, on the right-hand side of your, of your uh, screen, you should see a little box over there that says questions. Uh, this is gonna be a four-week session and it will be interactive. Um, part of it will be on us as the instructors, but a good portion of it is going to be on you as the students looking for answers and, and different things like that. So get familiar with that question box over there. Hopefully you'll be using that quite a bit. Um, our emails are on the screen there. If you want to take a screenshot of that, if you want to communicate with Jim or myself, um, Jay Resso at wellsdarby.com and Jay DePama at wellsdarby.com. You also have the ability to shrink and increase the size of the screen. So when we get into the boiler room, so to speak, um, you'll be able to increase the size of the boiler room and shrink the instructor and vice versa. So if you go to your webcam on the top of your screen and uh, there'll be three little uh, dots between the two screens and you just click there and you can drag left or right or up or down, and that will uh, allow you to change your screen size. So this is live. Uh, like I said, Jim is going to be answering questions. He's sitting right here to my right. So if there's any questions you have, you may hear him jump in and uh, throw a question out on the floor, and uh, we'll answer that. So week one, we're going to do this the next three weeks in a row. So we're Wells Darby, who are we? We are a manufacturer's rep agency. We cover Long Island, um, New York City, all the way up into the lower Hudson Valley. Uh, we're about uh, 85 people strong. We have everything from a uh, sales group that calls on distribution, all the way up through guys, engineers, and we call on engineers and uh, design work, you name it. Um, we cover that. We also have uh, department contractor services group that's the department that jim and i are in there's uh, six of us in this group three in long island three in new jersey so we're we spend the majority of our time with contractors and developing training programs uh, so that's a good portion of what we do we've been around for over 45 years so it's not a new rep agency um, a great history with some major product lines a lot of uh, a type product lines Taco and so on and we'll talk about a lot of them as we go through the program. So session one today, we're going to talk about some of the advantages of hydronic heating. We're going to talk about uh, heat loss. We're not going to get into heat loss. That's a whole standalone class on its own. Uh, we're going to compare what a new boiler type application would look like to a retrofit boiler application. The goal here is to help you understand what's the right appliance for the application because if we get the right appliance in the right application, we'll just see a full life out of that product and uh, the end user, the homeowner, will be happy. So that's really our goal. We're gonna uh, give you a few things to look for when you're going in and looking at whether it's a new boiler install or a retrofit type application. There is gonna be some industry terms and formulas. Um, I'll throw a couple of them out. If you hear me say heat emitter, that's, I could be talking about baseboard. I could be talking about an air handler. Anything that will take heat energy and dump it into a into a room, that to me is going to be a heat emitter throughout the course. And then we're going to get into, you see here on my right, I got a, a circulator and a couple zone valves. And then over here, we have a circulator job supply return. These are mocked up to be quote unquote boilers with all the components. And we're going to go through the components. Why do we put them where we put them and, and so on down the line. So that's all gonna be done today. So uh, strap in, that's week one. You did get some uh, email blast sent out to you and it was uh, requesting that you, you got a take out catalog that looks like this. Most of today, we're gonna to spend some time on page 44 and 45. So uh, that's important that you have those in front of you. Uh, we're going to look at a lot of things on here that are going to really set the groundwork for the next three weeks. So that's important. So usually a day or two before the class, 
usually it'll be Monday now. So on Mondays, check your emails. There may be more, there's gonna definitely be more information for you to download. It's best to have this in front of you. It's best to have, uh, if you're comfortable with your phone calculator or you need a standard calculator, have that available to you. Not a bad idea to have some type of a ruler um, for, for doing a little bit of drawing. And um, we're definitely gonna be doing some math. So have some scrap paper just to jot things down because like I said, we're gonna throw questions out to you guys and, and ladies, and we're gonna expect you to send answers into Jim. We wanna make sure that you're you know, staying in tune with the class. So that's week one. Week two, Jim will be covering week two. Uh, you may have never done a system design or you may do system design work every day. We are gonna simplify a system design and what we're going to do is we're going to give you a floor plan based on that floor plan you are going to pick whether it's going to be a cast iron or a condensing boiler to support the heat within the home we are going to take and go through and, and more than likely we're just going to go with a baseboard type application just to keep it neat and clean and we're going to take and do a full walkthrough of how you're going to do this layout in addition to that we'll go through a typical heat load calculation of distribution for our footprint you know, what does it look like from a degree day standpoint and how do we how does that help us see the heating pattern uh, in our area and pick the right appliance for the application uh, if you've never learned how to size a circulator uh, we want you to leave here by the end of this course knowing how to size a circulator correctly and we're going to also throw something out there that's not talked about a lot is a not only does a circulator have a performance curve but a system has a system curve also so jim will overlap the two and, and help you choose the correct circulator for the job so that's all going to take place in week two so that's 7 a.m next tuesday morning in week three we will cover static pressure in a boiler system we're going to we're going to do away with a, there's a big myth around static pressure in a boiler system we're going to we're going to simplify that and uh help you understand exactly how that works and whether it affects a circulator or not. We're going to talk about the location of a circulator within a boiler system and where does it go? Is it on the supply? Should it be on the return? You know, supply, return, that's going to be a topic and we're going to run through that and show you a couple of examples of best practice. We're going to touch on primary, secondary piping. And for week three, we're going to have a condensing NTI boiler here where the NTI guys will have an NTI boiler here with primary secondary piping on it and we will discuss everything about that primary secondary piping how it works why it's there and what goes on between the closely spaced t's so again we'll simplify primary secondary piping we're going to have the age-old discussion over is this a zone valve job or is this a circulator job and there's really no right answer to that question i'll prep you for it but just in the back of your mind just let that roll around and um, we're gonna put some numbers to circulator jobs and zone valve jobs, even though there's still no right or wrong answer there. Uh, as long as it's a take home product, it, it's the right answer. <laughs> okay, and then we're gonna get into what we call root cause troubleshooting. We're gonna put you in a boiler room, all right, with a, with a PowerPoint slide, and we're gonna give you the scenario, what the problem is in that boiler room. And then based on what you've learned in week one, what you've learned in week two, you're gonna apply that to the root cause troubleshooting in week three. And this is where, again, this is where, you know, you're gonna leave week three probably with a uh, migraine, but that's where we really need you to get familiar with, you know, going in there and typing some questions in. So if you wanna practice a little bit today and next week, that's fine. Just send Jim, hey, this is a test. I wanna make sure this works. It'd be good to do that because when we get into the root cause troubleshooting, like I said, all the work is gonna be in your lap. So you're gonna to wanna to have all of your handouts right close by that calculator to scrap paper, whatever you need to execute uh, troubleshooting of problems. All right, that's week three. In week four, we're gonna do a very brief review of weeks one, two, and three. We're gonna get into switching relays. So we, we're gonna go through and show you guys how to pipe these things up and you know, give you best practice scenarios of, of you know, being in the boiler room and what it should look like. Now we have to tie that together. We have this system here, how do we make it work? And we're gonna do that with our SR and ZVC panels. And Jim will go through and break that down. 
And then again, we're going to dive right back into root cause troubleshooting. So you will have, um, you know, you're probably looking at over an hour of uh, root cause troubleshooting, you know, throughout the course. So it's going to be a lot of smoke. <laughs> Hopefully none coming out of the controls. So our goal, Jim and myself, uh, we take and, you know, we review this course we, minimum one time a year. We go through and just fine tune it. So our goal is to answer all the whys. Okay, a lot of us have been put into a van with a, a technician, a mechanic, and we hop in the van and it's our job to pick up from that mechanic exactly how to fix things and how to install things. And that's fine. I started out in this industry. I hopped in a van with a guy and uh, we went in and we did boiler jobs every day. Never said a word to me, you know, why we're putting this here, this here, this here. Never said a word about any of that. I just did it and every day, we would work together. At the end of the day, we'd hit the switch and the boiler would run. So the goal was to get the boiler operational that day, right? And we did that, but it didn't benefit me at all because we really didn't discuss why. Why does this go here? Why does that go there? So our goal is to answer the whys, okay? We wanna help you understand the formulas, okay? Here's a formula on the board. We're gonna hit some more. We wanna help you understand the formulas we use every day to design and troubleshoot hydronic systems. That's what we want. We want to answer the whys. We want to help you figure out what formula to use, how to apply it to a specific problem. And our goal is we want you to leave our training with the information you came for. So be interactive. There's a ton going on behind the scenes here. Shoot questions off. We won't announce your name if, you know, whatever. You don't want your name set on the on the air, no problem. We don't have to announce your name. There's no such thing as a dumb question. If you have the question, ask it. We want you to leave here with what you came for. Okay, so that's an overview of our four-week program. So you, you have some homework assignments here. You're going to have to be involved. You have to be, you know, involved typing in them, those questions on the computer and having your materials in front of you so that you can feel comfortable answering these questions. That's the only way you're gonna get uh, what you want out of this course. So we're jumping right in. Why do we sell hydronic systems? Why do we sell hydronic systems? And everybody on the conference today, we're all in this for the same reason, it's comfort. And our goal is to supply the homeowner with the most comfort that we possibly can. And hydronics is a great medium to supply comfort to a homeowner. So that's our method. Our choice is to go with hydronics just from a comfort standpoint. So some of the benefits, some of the main reasons and the advantages of selling hydronics is um, we provide heat through convection and radiation. So that limits the loss of our heat from our body. So that makes us more comfortable in general. We don't have big temperature swings in the hydronics world, right? We can we can minimize those temperature swings as long as our skin, you know, we're not feeling cold air blowing across our skin or anything like that, we're comfortable, right? So that's one of the main reasons we sell hydronics. Flexibility. We can do, you know, anything we wanna do. If it's one zone, 10 zones, we can go nuts. These SR and ZVC panels, we can go out to 120 zones. Why? I don't know but we can. So if somebody has a need, we have a solution. And that's really the goal here is what solutions do you guys need in the field to help grow your business? We can do multiple temperatures. We can do towel racks. You want your towel warm in the morning? We can do that. You wanna heat your pool? We can do that with hydronics. You wanna melt the snow in your driveway or on your sidewalks? We can do that with hydronics. So these are all the reasons why hydronics is such a great heat medium to use, using that water to circulate it out through whatever it needs to go through and transfer that energy into this room, into a towel, melt your snow, whatever it might be. I always joke around about this next one here, improve indoor air quality. And why do I say that? Well, we've been in a pandemic for over a year now, it feels like, and uh, air quality is, is a concern to everyone. So do we improve air quality? No, but, um, one thing we don't do is if, you know, if I have a child that's homesick, I can isolate them in a room with hydronic heat, as long as I don't have an air handler, you know, baseboard heat, I could isolate them in a room where if I had a warm air system, 
and I was piped in properly with a supply and return minimum in each room, I would be pulling the germs from that room into the whole house every time that unit ran. So we don't improve air quality, but you know, you can understand those, those characteristics there. Quiet, even heat, no large temperature swings. So with the technology that's out there today, with outdoor reset, whether it's a cast iron boiler or a condensing boiler, we have the capability to put outdoor reset on there. So that has the ability to, you know, if you have those expansion creeks going on in someone's home, um, we can make a nice, quiet, even heat system across the board here. And efficiency. So condensing boilers, obviously, we see guys out there advertising 95% efficient, and that's true at certain areas, and that's great. So on the combustion side, we've gotten really efficient. So we use less fuel. But in addition to on the gas or oil side getting really efficient, we are now also have the ability to uh, be more efficient with these E-series circulators. So an E-series circulator, these are you know DC driven ECM circulators, um, up to 85% more electrically efficient than a typical AC circulator. So now we can really take a snapshot of the whole job and what can we do to make it fuel smart and electric smart? So we'll go through that. Some key advantages, like I said, flexible, one heat source, we can do whatever you wanna do. Central heating, multiple temperatures. Uh, I don't know how many temperatures you guys can do on a warm air system, but on a hydronic system, you name the number, we could probably do it. Uh, domestic hot water heating, snow melt, pool heating, it's all there. So this is a new home going up. That's Bob the Builder. We'll call him Bob the Builder up on the roof. He's going to reach out to you. He wants a heating system put into this new home. And that's great, right? That's business. That's one type application. Then we got this house right here built out of old wooden pallets. And this homeowner is going to reach out to you and they're going to want their heating system changed out in that home. And that'll be a retrofit. So no matter what, whether it's a new home or a retrofit, your best tool is some type of a heat loss calculation. Okay, a lot of guys are using RightSaw, Manual J. A lot of the rebates are attached to Manual J's, right? So I, we don't care what brand. Taco has a Flow Pro brand out there. I put on their brand X, just do it. That's your best tool, right? If, if, if I'm a contractor, I walk into your home and, you know, Put yourself as the homeowner. I walk in, I go, yep, this is a this is a four-section boiler. And then I have a, another company come in and they take the time to do a heat load calculation. They sit down with me at the table and say, okay, here's your heat loss, blah, 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 blah. This is what you need. This is the right appliance for the application. Who are you going to have more confidence in? The guy that came in and just said, I've been doing this for 30 years and this is a four-section boiler, or the people that actually take the time and give you a report that says this is what your heat load is for your home and this is why i'm able to do it this way and the reason i say that is because majority of the boilers in our footprint are oversized and reality is most of that 50 percent of those that are oversized are probably grossly oversized and we'll talk more about oversizing boilers and undersizing and what that does to a system in general uh, as we go along so there's a, that's just an example of a Takeo Flow Pro. It's just a click and drag type uh, heat load, gives you heating and cooling loads. But again, we don't care what heat loss calculator you use. We just really would like it if you used one to give the homeowner the right job. So if we're going to do a new or retrofit job, again, is it going to be a condensing product? Are we replacing the cast iron product? If we are, there's some things we'll address. If it's a cast iron product and we're going in with another cast iron product, that's fine. Cast iron is still a viable option and uh, works extremely well. So Bob the Builder called, says, I want you guys to come out. Here's a, uh, he had his architect and engineer give you a heat load calculation. So you got the heat load calculation and you're going to go there and say, okay, Heat loss calculation. Yes, he has it. He's going to give it to you. If he doesn't have it, you're going to do one. You're going to perform one. And then you're going to ask, you know, what type of heat emitters? Because this is all going to help you figure out what type of appliance you're going to install in this job. 
Okay, so that's going to be important to you. So is it going to be baseboard? Is it going to be an air handler? Is it going to be radiant? What type of a system will it be? Insulation value slash type I put on here. This is also important because if it's just going to be pink insulation, fine, no problem. We know what we're doing. We've been dealing with that for years and years and years. R value, you're good to go. But I put type on here if it's spray foam. Is it open cell or closed cell? Okay, how tight is this home now? Is it a poured concrete foundation? And I believe right here we can see that's a poured concrete foundation. That's also important for you to recognize. And the reason I touch on these items is because that poured concrete foundation is going to put a bunch of moisture into that home. And if this is a spray foamed house that's sealed up extremely tight, you may want to approach them with either an HRV or an ERV option. To exchange the air within the home to the outside okay that's very important because we need to get rid of that moisture that's coming from that concrete um, if you ever walk into a home a new home and there's moisture on the lower portion of the windows or foundation that's something to look at if they don't have any type of hrv or erv type system to where they're exchanging the air flipping the air within the house okay commercial buildings they have to do that schools they have to do that that's, a, that's something I have to do every day. In residential homes, a lot of times no one ever goes down that road of what do I need to do? This house is so tight. Um, I need to exchange the air within it. And if that builder, Bob the builder there, is putting this specific house up for a customer, it would be really good to understand what the homeowner's expectations are. Because if they put in a human car wash shower, but you sized it for a typical shower, they're gonna run out of hot water in a short period of time and homeowners never happy when they run out of hot water. So always try to ask the builder, is this for a specific person? Do we know, you know what all the appliances are gonna be within the home? Do we know all the flow rates within the home? Very important to know that and understand it. Then we're gonna get into this retrofit job. And uh, retrofit, that's probably the majority of what uh, a lot of guys are doing today. A lot of companies are doing so there's a bunch of different ways to size the boiler right we're going to match the rating plate on the old boiler and that's that works sure you have the exact same size boiler that you had in there for 30 years it may be right it may not be right we didn't do a heat load calculation we don't know we can measure the radiation and that'll tell us how much radiation is in the house it doesn't tell us if it's the right amount of radiation in the home it just tells us how much radiation is within the home and that becomes a really important factor when you're making a boiler choice decision. How much radiation is within the home? If it's over radiated, you can go to a condensing boiler and bring the temperatures down, right? So we can make that condensing boiler condense and run at a higher efficiency. We can clock the gas meter and that will tell us how much gas it burns within an hour or however long you wanna clock the meter for. That doesn't size the piece of equipment to the home. We can take the oil burner nozzle out and it's a one gallon nozzle and the pumps at 100 psi that means i will burn one gallon if this thing runs for one hour straight that's great but that doesn't tell you if the boiler size correctly to the home we're making a lot of assumptions there we can look at the gas orifice we can go down the line here the dimension of the boiler none of that truly tells us what is the right size boiler for the home so heat load calculation is your best tool in that retrofit home, what do I look for? Changes to the home. That's a great conversation to have with the homeowner while you're you know, walking the job. What changes have they made to the home? Did they insulate? Did they put new windows in? Did they put vinyl siding on? This will all reduce the uh, what companies use as the K factor of heat loss, basically, to the outside. That'll make the home use less fuel. I always pull the cover off the aquastat. And I want to know what the operating temperature of that boiler is when it's at max temperature. Usually numbers we always have in our industry are 160, 180. If I go down there and pull the cover off and that's at 200, I got to find out why that's at 200. I'm probably trying to get more heat out of my heat emitter because I may not have enough. Or, you know, something is undersized more than likely and they elevated the temperature to offset or undersizing of baseboard. That is key. 
because if I don't pull that Aquastat cover off and I had a boiler set at 210 and I put a condensing product in there that may only max out or some that max out at like 187 degrees, um, that's probably never going to work properly. So important to pull that off. Type of heat, heat emitters again. Is it baseboard? I'm going to put a condensing product in there. It, do I have the opportunity to make that boiler condense? You're selling them a system you want them to be comfortable with. You're selling them a system that is going to be efficient. You want to make sure it will condense because there's value in, in the condensation. System conditions. And I'm not just looking at system conditions from an outside perspective. I'm thinking of what's going on inside of those pipes. And what do I need to do to treat those to make sure that uh, I can deliver good, clean water through those pipes, which will transfer energy better to the home. And in addition to that, it's important to know because I have a condensing product here and I may take all the dirt and debris from the home and deposit it into my condensing boiler and have a premature boiler failure. So that's what I'm talking about here when I'm talking about system conditions. And again, that homeowner has expectations when you come in there to give them a proposal. If they got creaking on the third floor, changing out the boiler is probably not going to fix that creaking on the third floor. But in their mind, they think it will. Oh, I'm changing the boiler. Everything's going to be fixed. Not necessarily the case. So just make sure you have that conversation with the homeowner, everything working okay. If you have an existing boiler in the home now, it's always a good idea to run that to you know, a full operation mode and just watch it run, function, and listen to it and make sure that uh, when you give them a proposal to replace the boiler, you can meet all those expectations. Oversizing of a boiler, what are the problems? Short cycling, higher fuel bills, premature con control failures, and higher service and, and maintenance costs. So in short, if I oversize it and it stops and starts, that's like taking your service van and going down the busiest road you know with a red light every other block and getting every red light. Stop and go, stop and go, stop and go. You use a lot more fuel. We want to get these boilers to come on and run at what we call steady state. So boiler's always the dirtiest when it starts and when it shuts down. So we want to try to get a boiler to come on, run steady state for as long as it has to, satisfy the demand, shut off, and, and wait. Every component on that boiler has been <clears throat> cycle tested and everyone is cycle tested. It's gonna have so much life in it. So that's why we don't want a boiler short cycling because we'll wear out the components faster, which again, it should have higher service and maintenance costs. Undersizing a boiler, it's just not gonna heat home properly um, depending on what the outdoor temperature is. But usually as you get colder outside, you won't have enough BTU to heat the home. That's what undersizing will do. So just while we got this on here, um, I always talk a little bit about condensing modulating boilers. Uh, you, you never really want to oversize a condensing modulating boiler. I know they modulate. I know they have turn down rates. Jim will talk a lot about this next week, but um, we want to make sure that we size that boiler properly. Always look at your smallest heat circuit in the home and then look at your boiler size and say, when this thing is turned all the way down, how close am I to my smallest heat circuit? And figure out if that boiler is the right one for that job. The system conditions, this is what I was talking to earlier. Um, again, these are cleaners. These would go into the boiler system prior to removing the boiler. You put these in, they circulate around the system, warm water, they activate quicker. Um, if you had a catastrophic boiler failure, this would be done through a bucket and pumped into the system. But if your boiler is still in, you can shoot this right into the boiler, let it circulate within the system. It'll go through and think of a nylon brush going through the inside of your pipes, cleaning up all those pipes, bringing that debris back. So when you remove that boiler, you're going to take all that dirt and debris out. Then you'll flush the system and you'll have a nice clean system to hook that new boiler up to. So there's a couple different brands, Furnox and Sentinel. And again, we're, we're, we don't rep any of these products. This is just a good practice. If you read any manufacturer's manual, somewhere in the first few pages, they'll talk to you about flushing the system, whether it's cast iron or condensing. And there's the 
couple of different products. Again, they're, they're kind of like an aerosol candle. They'll shoot right into the boiler. Okay, so now we're going to get into some terms here. Uh, a BTU, and this is stuff we're going to use as we go forward. So a BTU is a British thermal unit. This is the amount of energy needed to raise one pound of water, one degree Fahrenheit. And that could be natural gas, that could be oil, that could be a wood burning stove, that could be anything, right? I could use a candle. If I can elevate that one pound of water one degree, I'm putting one BTU into that water. And water is gonna be our heat medium. And we're gonna talk about that as we go forward. So BTU, okay, right here in one of our most important formulas right there, BTU. So that's gonna be very important. BTU is going to be a big part of our talk track here. Uh, GPM, gallons per minute. We could refer to that as flow or GPM, gallons per minute. That's going to be another, another one. You can also see that. That's right here on the board. That's going to be in, in several of our, of our formulas that we're going to use. Another one is this right here, this triangle with a T. This is delta T. That's temperature differential. So what we mean by temperature differential is we're gonna have a temperature leaving the boiler. It's gonna leave the boiler. It's gonna go out through the heat emitters, out through the heat circuit. It's gonna come back to the boiler and it's gonna be at a different temperature because we just gave off the energy in that space through the heat emitters. That is a delta T, delta T. That's gonna be something you need to know as we're going forward because we're gonna, we're going to harp on that. And again, could be flow rate or GPM. We're probably going to call it, uh, you know, we'll call it both throughout the next three weeks, but um, you know that they're both the same, basically, we're, what we're looking at here. Flow or GPM, we're going, to, we're going to use that term constantly. Flow and velocity. Um, velocity is a big deal in, in the hydronics world. Okay, if this is a gallon of water right here in, in a pipe, our goal is to move that every second, two to four feet from where it was originally. If we're not moving it two to four feet per second, if we're under two, uh, we don't have the ability to move little micro bubbles, air bubbles in a system in a downward pipe. We're not going to be able to move them. So we want to have at least two feet per second of velocity. And our goal is to keep it somewhere between two and four feet. And the reason we want to be between two and four feet is that's where we'll have a nice, flexible, quiet system. If we were to start moving water at six feet per second, we will start to create noise within the piping. And if we were to move water at eight feet per second, we will start to erode metallic pipe. So again, velocity is important. And we're going to go through sizing of circulators and help you figure that out. AC current, it's alternating current. That is what our typical, right here, we have some typical AC style circulators. This is our, you know, typical, could be a 007, 0015, either or. This is what we see as a AC driven circulator. So this uses about 80 watts of energy. So think of uh, turning on an 80 watt light bulb, and this will run about 2,500 hours a year in our footprint for heating. So that's the runtime approximately of a circulator. So 80 watt light bulb on in your home for 2,500 hours. That's the equivalent of a AC circulator running within your home. ECM, electrically commentated motor. Uh, we are DC driven. So this is a ECM motor, DC driven, okay? This will be about 85% more electrically efficient. This will run anywhere from four watts to 44 watts of energy. So same run hours, turn that light on, let's call this a light. Now we're looking at anywhere between four and 44 watts of energy, depending on how many zones may be calling at any given time. So that's where the electrical efficiency comes in that we were talking about earlier. Next up, we have the AFUE rating, the Annual Fuel Utilization Efficiency, AFU rating. 
The AFU rating on boilers is calculated at 140 degree supply water, 120 degree return water. Now we know, said earlier, 160, 180 is pretty common for boiler temperatures. So we're not really achieving those efficiencies of the AFU rating when we're running them at higher temperatures. So if we put in a condensing product that says I am 95% efficient, yes, it would be 95% efficient at 120, 140. But if I elevate that to 190, my efficiency comes down. And I think we show a few charts in, uh, in here throughout the program to uh, back that up. So, okay, now we get into <clears throat> the, we're gonna get into the meat and bones of this whole, the whole class here. So this is on page 44. If you have this in front of you, it's on page 44. It's gonna be the very top formula. It says universal hydronic formula. And in that universal hydronic formula, we need to understand Gallon per hour or gallon per minute, BTU per hour divided by delta T times 500. So we gave you those terms, what the GPM means. We told you what the BTU H is, that's your boiler capacity basically in this scenario. We haven't given you a delta T yet. And this 500, what is it? Where does it come from? So this is a uh, gallon container. This gallon holds, or this container holds a gallon of water. This would weigh 8.33 pounds. If I take this gallon of water that weighs 8.33 pounds, and I multiply that by 60 minutes, the hour, that will give me like four, nine, eight, da 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 da. da. We round it to 500. So what we're saying is that this gallon of water that weighs 8.33 pounds over one hour, this equals 500. And then in the formula there, you see on your screen, there's a times one. If I'm using water, it stays times one. If I'm using antifreeze, I have to look at the container of the antifreeze and it will tell me what the rating of that antifreeze is. And I can go in and recalculate because it will no longer be 500. It'll be lower than 500 because antifreeze wants to reject the heat. So it doesn't have the ability to absorb as much heat energy as water, straight water. So it will be a lower number. On page 44, if you scroll down just a little bit on page 44 in that TACO guide, it gives you the BTU per hour at 68 degrees. If I have 30% glycol or if I have 50% glycol in there, and it will break it down to where if it's straight water at 68 degrees, it's 500. If it's glycol at 30% at 68 degrees, it's 445 would be my new number times my delta T. So if I'm using antifreeze, I normally don't wanna go over 50% with antifreeze on any manufacturer's boiler. That's usually their rule, not my rule, that's their rule. So understand if you're using antifreeze, your, your BTU is gonna be a little less because that antifreeze is gonna to wanna to reject the heat a little bit. So we know where this is going to come from. We know where this is going to come from. We know where this 500 comes from now. The next thing we need to understand is where does this come from? What is the delta T? What does it mean? Where does it come from? So that's going to come from the manufacturers that you're working with. So when you're working with a boiler manufacturer, that boiler manufacturer will have a delta T. When you're working with baseboard, they will have a design delta T. And uh, we'll give you those here in a minute. So what does this look like? fast fingers no there we are a gallon of water there's the gallon of water 8.33 pounds multiply that by your hour there you go 500 that'll be consistent so knowing this formula is going to be huge we broke it down one more time here so gallon per minute equals load divided by 500 times delta t so here we're giving you a 20 degree delta t so i'm going to go over to the board i'm going to put 20 right here 20 times 500 and that's going to give me 10,000. So what that's telling me is this gallon of water has the ability to absorb 10,000 BTU and deliver 10,000 BTU over the course of that hour, right? 
So this is this is the start of understanding what I'm using as a heat medium, which is water, what I'm using for my heat emitters, and how am I going to take the energy that this boiler produces and start to deliver it to my system. That's what this starts to, I want to get the gears turning here, and I want everybody to understand we have to take that water that's in that boiler, we have to take and distribute it to our heat circuits, we have to deliver the heat energy to those heat circuits, and then we have to bring it back and we have to re-energize it, we have to reheat it, send it back out again. So where does this 20 come from? 20 degree delta T, majority of the boiler manufacturers out there all look for a 20 degree delta T. And that's where they're comfortable operating, 20 degree delta T. When you, need, when you get into the condensing marketplace, you may see some manufacturers, as the boilers get larger, they may offer you a 30 degree delta T. Okay, and we'll, we'll go through a whole bunch of different delta T's and get you familiar with how to do the math. So baseboard heat. If I have baseboard heat around this room that I'm standing in right now, I should enter that baseboard at one temperature, go through the baseboard and come back. The goal is on a design day, I'll have a 20 degree delta T. Design day is gonna be different. We're all, anyone who's on this class right now, wherever you are, there's a design, there's a design temperature for your area, okay? If I got up by my house, it's zero. Down here where I am in New Jersey, it's 14. Around Long Island, it's 14. So depending on where you are, there is a design outdoor temperature that you design for. So all of these different heat emitters, they all have a 20 degree delta T. So if you're unsure when you're looking at a job, what the delta T of the job should be, unless it's radiant, you can probably assume 20 degree delta T and that will get you in the ballpark for sure. So when you get into some of these jobs, um, and a lot of these are not handouts. You want to take a you know phone snapshot. Have at it. Um, if I have three quarter pipe going to a heat circuit, the maximum amount of baseboard I can have on that heat circuit is 67 feet, and that's at 600 BTU per foot. And if I do that math, that will basically tell me I'm at about 40,000 BTU. So that's about the average number that we want to move through three quarter inch pipe would be 40,000 BTU. And I wouldn't wanna go beyond 67 feet of heat emitter, baseboard heat emitter, because I will I won't have the ability to keep that 20 degree delta T on there, which means I'm gonna start delivering less BTU. And you can go right down through this list here and do the math on them and multiply them out. And they will all equal right about here, what we're looking at, in this column right here, 20 degree delta T, we're gonna carry this BTU based on this flow rate, based on this diameter of pipe. So the most common we use in our industry is inch and a quarter for manifolding boilers. That's good for about 14 gallons per minute and about 140,000 BTU with a 20 degree delta T. Three quarter is probably the most common size we use for heat circuits good for about four gallons per minute, good for about 40 BTU, 40,000 BTU, sorry. That's at a 20 degree delta T and that's an average flow rate. Can we put more water through there? Yes, we can. Can we put a little bit less water through there? Yes, we can. But if you adhere to those numbers, that will keep your velocity in check so you don't have noise and you're still able to move those little micro air bubbles in the system, that'll give you the ability to move them. Um, let me just back up. This right here would be a good one to uh, have a photo of. You will use this heavily in week three and week four. Good on questions, Jim. Absolutely. Everybody's on the edge of their seats. And <laughs> this is just to confirm some of the flow rates. Um, Again, if you want to take a quick snapshot of that, that'll keep you within that two to four feet per second on your flow and velocity. Okay, keep us away from having noise. There's the velocity again, two to four feet per second. Once we get above four, we get to six, noise, we get to eight, erosion. Okay, here we have a formula. 
And this formula right here is going to take and tell us a lot about hot water. This is recovery time. So this is recovery time based upon what am I trying to heat? What am I trying to heat it with? And what does that look like? Okay, so we have a 40 gallon tank here. And it's an indirect. When you're talking about tanks, whether it's a tank style water heater, an indirect, each manufacturer has to adhere to a certain standard, but uh, usually it's within 80% of advertised number. So here we have a 40 gallon indirect. That 40 gallon indirect holds 36 gallons of water. Okay. In the first set of parentheses there, 115, that is our delivery temperature to the home. We have a 50 degree incoming temperature. There's our 500. And this is a 100,000 BTU boiler. So in this scenario, we're going to do the math in the parentheses first. So we have a 36 gallon tank, 115 minus 50 equals 65. So it's 36 times 65 times 500 divided by our boiler size. So if I've just put a brand new boiler in and everything was piped and pumped properly, and I turn the switch on, in that application, 11.7 minutes after I turn the switch on, the boiler will heat up. I will transfer that heat energy over to that indirect. That indirect will be satisfied at 115 degrees in 11.7 minutes. And you're going to go, wow, that's a great indirect. There's no brand on there. There's no nothing. But you're going to say that's a great indirect because it heated up so quickly. Well, it heated up so quickly because you have it piped and pumped properly. All right, I'll give you another scenario. So this is where we're going to start to do some work. I said a lot in week three and week four, but we're going to do a little bit today also. So write this down. It's the same indirect. It's 36 gallons. In your parentheses this time, I want to elevate the 115. I want to make that 120. The incoming water will remain at 50 degrees. But somebody put a Honeywell zone valve on this indirect. So that means our 100,000 BTU boiler goes away and you replace that with 35,000 BTU. All right, so do the math. You have your 36 gallon tank. Do the math in your parentheses, then multiply 36 times your number times 500. Divide that by your Honeywell zone valve, 35,000 BTU, and send Jim some answers of how long that should take to heat up that tank. Please. scenario yeah good scenario a lot of them out there all right we've got three answers and they're spot on 35 36 minutes joe william richard good yeah all right everybody understand how they did that i'll throw it up here on the board real quick we have a 36 gallon tank we had 120 minus 50 and Again, that is delivery temperature of 120, incoming water temperature at 50. That's 70 degree difference here, right? Multiply that by 500. And then I'm gonna divide that by, again, I got a Honeywell zone valve. A Honeywell zone valve moves 35,000 BTU. So when I multiply this out, that is going to give me approximately 36 minutes. Yep. 36 minutes to heat up that indirect. And you're going to 
and say, man, that's a terrible indirect. But reality is it's what we're driving it with. And this is this is a formula that you can use in the field to make sure that uh, when the homeowner is complaining of insufficient hot water or after we take two showers, we have no hot water. This is something to look at when you go in there and try to figure out what's the root cause of the no hot water situation. OK, so that is recovery time formula. Um, you can utilize this in a lot of different scenarios. If it was a direct fired water heater, you could do the same thing, divide it out by, you know, if it's a 40,000 BTU water heater, you would make this uh, 40,000 BTU and you would come up with your time in the 20 somewhere to, to make that tank hot again. So very useful. Put this somewhere, you know, in your truck. This is a keeper. Okay. So now we're going to get to uh, talking about boilers here a little bit because that's part of this course, right? So here we have a couple of mock boilers and uh, these are roll cabinets that's uh, pretending to be our boiler. So we mounted a couple of circulator flanges on here and we're going to take and uh, we're going to take and go through it. So right off the top of the boiler, if your boiler has a low water cutoff, great. If it doesn't, you have an opportunity to put a low water cutoff in two different versions. You got a 24 volt version, you got a 120 volt version, either or. That is going to be connected to a probe that looks like this. And the goal here is when we put this in, we had a couple of questions in the last session we did. So when you put this in, read the manufacturer's instructions. They're going to tell you whether they want you to use dope or paste or tape. And they're going to tell you if they want one or two threads exposed. Depending on the manufacturer, they may have different guidelines. Um, that's to make sure that we can have a ground. This rod connects right here through this nut directly to the low water cutoff. And what that does is this sends a signal and this signal goes into the water. The minerals in the water allow this to see a ground connection. And if we lose water <clears throat> below this level, in the in the boiler will lose the continuity that we have on this ground and we'll shut the boiler down that's the goal of the low water cutoff so it is important that when you're putting this into the t that you look at the depth of the t to make sure that you're not pushing this metal rod from the low water cutoff right up against the malibu t or the black iron t whatever it is because if you do the low water cutoff will never work this is why when you install a low-order cutoff, best practice is to always test it before you leave the job site. And the reason you're testing it is you want to make sure that this is not touching the back wall. When we bring the water level down below the low-order cutoff, the unit should shut down. This probe, over its course of its life, will have to be cleaned. Again, look at whichever manufacturer you're using. Look at the manufacturer's guidelines on cleaning that probe. Because again, if this gets all corroded, it may not work properly. So we can start right out of the top of the boiler. You always want to have this on top of the boiler. You want to make sure that there's no valves between the lower cutoff and the boiler. Inspectors will fail you for having a valve between the lower cutoff and the boiler. So we come right off the top of the boiler, the riser pipe of the boiler, the hot takeoff of the boiler supply, go to our lower cutoff. Here we come up with a riser nipple an elbow, another nipple, and then into a 4900 air separator. So what is the responsibility of this air separator? The responsibility is to take any air that may be flowing through this pipe, run through these pawl rings. This is a Takeo 4900. Take the air, bring it up to the top of this chamber, this taper on the chamber. Uh, we never put water all the way up to the top. So these are very robust. We bring the air up and we expel the air out of the 4900. Just to let you know, this is a commercial product. We brought it down into the residential market. This upper portion of the 4900, we use that same device all the way up through our eight inch air separators, just so you understand how robust that is. We also have these pole rings in here. They're stainless steel pole rings. There's a stainless steel, uh, for lack of a better word, I'll call it a fence that goes around the inside to keep these pole rings in the 4900. 
and we break down air molecules down to 10 microns. So that's the, the best in the industry, to my knowledge. Okay, so no minimum distance. If this were a cast iron air scoop, you need a minimum of 18 inches from your closest elbow to that cast iron air scoop. That allows the air to work its way up to the top of the pipe and then expel it from the system. With these air separators, you don't, there's no minimum distance. Most guys will go just large enough on this nipple to fit their expansion tank. If you're doing any type of condensing equipment, these are a must because you don't want a, a supply sensor or a return sensor to read a superheated air pocket as it goes through the heat exchanger and throw you into an error code. So these are a must when you're doing condensing high efficiency equipment. This area right here is the area we call the point of no pressure drop. And the reason we call it that is because this is where our feed valve and backflow preventer, expansion tank and air separator all live right here in this area. So the goal of the expansion tank is to keep 12 PSI. That's what it should come shipped at, 12 PSI on the bottom of this rubber diaphragm. We have this feeder black flow preventer here that is going to maintain 12 PSI of water pressure on the boiler system. And that becomes now a complete system. We got 12 on the bottom, 12 on the top. This becomes the point of no pressure drop. Then we go into our circulator and out to the system. So you have the ability here, this is a 3450. Uh, you have the ability to change out the components. So this feed valve, this is the feed valve side. You would just loosen up this little black knob right here and then take this green knob and you can rotate this and you can see, hopefully you can see on the screen that the little identifier inside here, the little green identifier is moving. That's adjusting the pressure in that system. And the nice thing about this, you don't have to worry about it blowing off the relief valve. If I set this to 26 PSI, I just push this button one time, the feeder will fill to 26 PSI and shut off. If this is in an area where you can't see it, this is nice because I can rotate that sight glass anywhere I need to. So that I'm in a position where I can see it. This is replaceable on the unit. You don't have to take the body out. This is replaceable. That's the feed valve side of that feeder backflow. And it just goes right back in with a rubber O-ring on it. And then on the other side is the check valve backflow preventer. Um, again, this is replaceable. So the body will stay on the job and I can replace either the backflow preventer or the feed valve side. This has an O-ring, a screen, check valve internally. So if you shut the feed off, it's not gonna drain the boiler system like a typical backflow. All right, so it'll keep the pressure on the system. So that's a, that's a 3450 feeder backflow, press, thread, sweat, all three versions are available, um, but that's pretty, pretty unique when it comes to the boiler pressure reducing valve uh, realm. So point of no pressure drop, we got a nipple here, we got a shut off valve, we have a circulator. So this circulator is what we call on the push, right? We're pumping away from the boiler, away from the expansion tank, which is what we want to do because our goal is to, I know we call these pumps all the time, they're circulators. All they do is they create a pressure differential. Our goal is to keep the backside at the system pressure, which is 12. And when this comes on, we want to be able to bump that up. It'll bump it up four to five PSI. And then we're going to use that additional four to five PSI to send it up through the heat circuit, out through the heat emitters, back down to the return side. On this one, we have the zone valves on the return. Um, the zone valves could be on the supply. It's really a preference thing. I like them on the return just because it's a couple of degrees cooler and maybe they're gonna live a more comfortable life and give you a better performance. But uh, so that is a typical cast iron type boiler pipe job. And that's what we're looking at here from a zone valve standpoint. If we go over here, we have the same components, same risers, same everything, same point of no pressure drop. But here we have a two zone circulator system. And that's just what you know we wanted to show. Um, on the screen, you'll see we have uh, a two zone 
zone valve job and a five zone circulator job. So that's what we would use if it were a typical cast iron type application, let's call it under 200,000 BTU. And if we were to take and step over to a condensing version, uh, we would be looking at the same type components with the difference being we would take and need to do primary secondary piping, which is located right here. The rule for primary secondary piping is the maximum distance we want from outside of this T to outside of this T is four to eight pipe diameters of the size of pipe you're working with. So a lot of times you'll see in there it says, uh, you know, 12 inch max. Well, if you're with an inch and a quarter pipe, that would be 12 inch max. If you're working with larger pipe, it can be a little further. If you're working with smaller pipe, it can be smaller. So same type of scenario here with the condensing uh, boiler job. You know, we come off of the boiler. So there's a, there's, a, there's a boiler circuit here. There's a circulator in this boiler that's moving the water around to satisfy the heat exchanger in the boiler. And then we come out here through a 4900. Here's our point of no pressure drop, right? We got an expansion tank, a feed valve. We go into the, call it the suction side of the circulator, and then come out the positive side and feed those four zones. We got four zone valves on a return. And then we have a ZVC panel controlling the system and our low water cutoff is at the top of the boiler. You never put the low water cutoff below the water level in the boiler. It should always be above it. And then right next to it, same type scenario, primary secondary piping. This is a circulator job. We have the circulators all on the on the push, pumping away from the boiler, up through the heat circuits, dropping back down into the returns. And um, this is an SR panel controlling the circulators for that job. Jim, how are we doing on questions? We're doing okay. I have one gentleman just wanted to review how we got to that 36 minutes. I I, uh, I did answer him, showed him the math. All right, so we're gonna do another one then. Yeah. That's what that means. Okay, so let's just jump away from the boilers. You guys got that. We did a cast iron boiler, we did a, did a condensing boiler. We will talk more about primary, secondary um, throughout the next three weeks. So I have a scenario on the board right now. I'm going to change this. We had some questions on it. That means if one guy has a question, several people have questions. All right. So we'll stick with a 40 gallon indirect because that's pretty common, right? This time we're going to look at our incoming water at 40 degrees. It's real cold out, right? This would be like February, middle of February when it was real cold out. So we're going to do the math there. Somebody shoot Jim the answer to insert here. And we're going to stick with, um, we're going to put a uh, zone sentry on there. Crest zone sentry. We can move 95,000 BTU through a zone sentry zone valve. Okay, what do we got here? Anybody answer you, Jim? Not yet. I got a couple of people asking 80s, what we're going to put between the parentheses. Yes. So like 80, good. Yeah. So now do the math. I got a 36 gallon storage tank. My temperature differential, incoming water at 40, sending 120 degrees to my faucet, to my shower. That difference between there is 80 degrees. 500 remains the same. That's a common number we use. That's what a gallon of water can absorb and, and, and transfer energy. Here we're going to use a zone sentry zone valve. Even though I'm not a fan of zone valves on indirects, we're going to use that for this scenario. Answers are rolling in. Everybody's got the right answer. 15.1, 15.15. 15 15.1 minutes. How many guys answered that? Uh, looks like about a half a dozen so far. Okay. Is that as clear as mud for everybody? I don't want to move on. If uh we can bang these out real fast. These are these are super easy to do. Everybody seems to be okay. Okay. Okay is good. But I think it was just you know understanding the formula and doing the math within the parentheses first. 
Gotcha. And then just then going through the process. Okay, so a little bit more of a commercial type application. Okay. Because it's commercial type application, we have an 80 gallon tank in there with 76 gallons of storage. Uh -oh. 76 gallons of storage, 50 degree incoming water, 140 degree going out to the dishwasher. And then there's a preheater on the dishwasher. Okay. This time we have a circulator on there. We have a 0010, which is pretty common on indirects. So that 0010 is moving. We're going to call it uh, 15 gallons per minute. So if I use 15 gallons per minute, right? Gallons per minute equals BTU. I know my delta T is going to be 20. If I take 10, I multiply that by my gallons per minute, 15, that'll give me BTUH. That's the universal hydronic formula flipped the other way. So 76 gallons of storage in that tank. 50 degree incoming water, 140 degrees going out to the faucets. Give me the number for air. Anybody fill that gap? Hang on, I'm trying to do it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yep, rolling in. Does it look like that? 90? Yep, that's the gap. That's the parenthesis. Guys have that. Okay. What do we got over here? 22.8 minutes. Are they correct? They are correct. How many guys and are they any different guys? No, no. The same blue, you know, is answering these questions, it looks like. I had one very high achiever actually put in the formula for me. <laughs> Fantastic. Absolutely. A quick typer, that is. <laughs> yeah, he's fast. I gotta, I gotta get, we gotta give him a shout out. Dan, excellent. Keep it up, Dan. We'll have you up here with us before you know it. <laughs> All right, everybody's good on recovery time. They got it. Okay, perfect. All right, we keep going. We will keep going. So there is a whole realm of ECM circulators out there. I just want to make sure you guys are aware of what's available to you. So this is a little bit of product overview, but it's important. So that 006E right there, that is a recirculation style circulator. Um, it will marry up to a lot of different systems right on the box. It will tell you what it will marry up to. We have complete recirculation systems available with uh, what's called a little hot link. It'll go underneath the sink if you don't have a dedicated return line. Um, as long as you have a tank style water heater, you can use one of those circulators with a hot link. 007E, we have 007E. We have it in a two flange and a four flange footprint. Um, the reason I'm pulling this one up is this is now stock OEM part on a lot of cast iron and condensing boilers. So your NTI in the condensing side, your uh, Well McLean, your Burnham boilers, um, they're coming through standard EC, ECR products. They're coming through standard with an ECM 007E circulator. So we're gonna dive into this 007E, make sure everybody's familiar with it. 0015E3. This is probably one of the best service pumps you could have on your van. And if you get it in the four-way flange configuration, um, this will cover from your basically like a 003 range all the way up above a 008 range uh, on, on your typical home. This gives you the flexibility to put it on low, medium, or high and uh, hit that whole range of circulators. If you have a problem job or you really are into the high-tech world, um, I say high tech, it's Bluetooth, so it's really not that high tech. But if you like gadgets, the 0018E, you have the ability to see on your phone through Bluetooth when you're in the boiler room, let's call it. You're not going to see it from afar, but when you're in the boiler room, you can take your phone and you can look at that 0018E and you will know the exact head and flow of that circulator 
right there live on the spot. And if you need to make adjustments, you can go right there to the little knob on the back of that 0018E, make your adjustments and dial it into your system so that you're hitting the proper system curve and performance curve of that circulator. Next step up would be the 0026E. This is a new launch for Taco. Um, this will get us into that 200, 250,000 BTU range with an ECM circulator. And we have a bunch of different settings on there, uh, depending on what type of system you're connecting it to. We go all the way up to, uh, we got the 0034E, which is right here. Again, this knob will give you a ton of opportunities to set the circulator up about four different ways. We have the 0026 and the 0034 in cast iron and stainless. So you're, you're just seeing a part of what Taco is doing. We're the only uh, only game in town with the one there that says 00E all the way to the left. That is a, a temperature driven circulator. That, that circulator will look at the supply temperature and the return temperature. And if we set that for 20, because that's what our boiler wants, that's what our system wants, that circulator will try and maintain that 20 degree delta T every single time it's on. So we're the only game in town with a delta T circulator. Everything else we're looking at are all delta P, pressure, kind of like a standard AC circulator, pressure. And we go all the way up into the commercial market there with that uh, 1915E stainless and cast iron. And then we got a double O series there to the left on the bottom. Um, that will get us, uh, you know, the, the 20, 25, 30, 15, 25, 30. That'll get us into a whole nother realm of uh, commercial type applications. So Taco is now about working on the sixth year of being in this ECM marketplace. Um, they are the leaders in the ECM marketplace. They actually purchased a company in uh, Europe that was uh, building e-style circulators since 2002. So Taco wants to be the leader in this category and they currently are leading the category. And just to give you an idea here, a uh, blow up, blown up picture of the 0026E. So low tells you it's eight feet. We have active adapt, which will work with, you know, uh, if you have Danfoss valves or something like that on a system, it will actively adapt to the system. If you do a big zone valve job, as you close zone valves, it will actively adapt and reduce the flow of the system when you start to close zone valves down. The 0026E and the 0034E are both 115, 208, 230 volt out of the box. So you're not buying different circulators for different voltages. All of these E-series circulators that we've shown you today only need two wires no ground required. So if you're working in an older home and there's only two wires available, um, these motors are, are double insulated. We do not need a ground for the E-series circulators that we offer. So low, medium, high, you can even do a zero to 10 volt signal. So a lot of different opportunities here with these ECM circulators. And this is just a circulator curve uh, for constant pressure mode. All right, this is fixed speed mode. This is what active adapt would look like. And um, again, it will adjust itself. And then here, if you have a zero to 10 volt DC input, that's how it will work. Excuse me, John. Yes, sir. Good question from, uh, from Thomas. If we're using the double OE set to a 20 degree delta, so he's referring to the DT2218. Yep. Would you still have to set the boiler or, or do you have to set the temperature on the boiler? So the boiler, the boiler is always going to be the king, right? It's always going to run to whatever target we set the boiler at. Um, so if we have a dual aquastat where we got 160, 180, um, usually the 160, the low side is geared around hot water. So the low side is geared around the bottom end of hot water. The high side is geared around satisfying your home and heating mode. So the circulator will do its thing. It doesn't know what the temperature is. It just wants to maintain a 20 degree delta T. So 
we have applications where guys use it to protect cast iron boilers from condensing, right? So it will not dictate the boiler temperature. It will not drive the boiler temperature, but it will maintain a 20 degree delta T as long as you're within the curve of the flow, it will maintain that 20 degree delta T. That's adjustable too, guys. Um, comes out of the box at 20 because that's the most common number, but we can adjust anywhere between five and 50 degrees on that temperature differential. So if I were to put a VT on here, my supply sensor would be here before my two zone takeoffs. And my return sensor would be here closest to entering the boiler, going back into the boiler um, after both of my zones come together and drop back down into the boiler. All right, and just while we were talking earlier, I should have talked about this a little earlier, but it's right here in front of me. This is a uh, Taco. So 4,900, basically, that Taco has put a 13,000 Gauss magnet. So this becomes a mag dirt separator. So this would be mounted right here on the boiler. And for there's a valve that comes with it. There's a cap that comes with that if you want to use it. This is your magnet strip right here. So you would get to the job site. If you want to flush out the system, you would open this valve. You would take and pull this magnet strip off. And while this magnet strip is off, all the dirt and metallic pieces within the system would be flushing out of the system. After you're done, you would close the valve, just take this magnet, pop it back on, and you're back with your mag dirt separator here. So another option if you're doing condensing boilers and you're putting it into a dirty system, You'll see this on the NTI boiler we'll have in front of you here over the next couple of weeks. So we'll show you where that mag dirt separator goes and what it would look like. The 0034E, again, you have it in both versions of uh, stainless or cast iron. So it can be a research pump, it can be a system pump. And then here's that 007E, standard on Walm Claim Burnham, ECR, NTI. It, it's it's basically, uh, it's becoming the AC 007 of the past. It's it's starting to start not that the 007 has gone anywhere, but the E is starting to eat into the 007 share. This is a typical 007E curve. So it will run at 10 feet of head all the way out till we get to about 8.25 gallons per minute. So about 82,500 BTU and then it will start to run along its slanted curve. And basically what we're looking at when we're running on this curve is about 44 watts. When we're running along this curve right here, the 10 foot curve, uh, it will be less. And it's gonna be less based upon how many holes or zone valves are open within the system, or if it's just a circulator system, wherever the gallon per minute rate flows. So four gallons a minute and three quarter pipe, it would run right here and it would reduce the, the power demand of that circulator. So next slide up is a 007E and this is basically what we're looking at. Um, this is the eye of the circulator. How all of these wet rotor circulators work is the first time you put water to a system, water goes in through the eye and fills this inner portion. And this is no different on a standard 007, 007E, all of them, they work the same way. The difference with the ECM versions is this rotor is magnetized. Okay, so it's a permanent magnet. So with an AC motor, we have to rotate the motor to create magnetism. Here, we have a permanent magnet. This is why we run at lower wattages, because we have a permanent magnet. We're just driving it, pulsing it to drive it. One thing with the Takos is Taco is an American company. They know the water conditions here in the US. This little brass looking washer that you see right here, that is what we call a bio barrier. Two things kill circulators, air and black iron oxide. Black iron oxide is found in all of our heating systems from metallic pipe breaking down and uh, floating around within the system. What we do to keep that black iron oxide, which is metallic, from attaching itself to the permanent magnet rotor is we put this bio barrier there. 
and that biobarrier, when the water comes through the eye, that becomes a, a barrier to keep all that black iron oxide out in the system, not allowing it to get into the rotors. Okay, if anyone has been in the industry that's on the call as long as I have, uh, we used to run around 20, 25 years ago with a little ball peen hammer in our toolbox. And when there was a seized circulator, you would tap on the side of it and that would break the black iron oxide loose and get that motor to rotate. Well, Taco has put a black iron oxide barrier here so that those metallic pieces cannot get to this rotor. And we're the only one in the game here that's doing that. So, so this goes in, you can see it pulls in pretty hard. All right, that's a permanent magnet. If you take a 007 cartridge out, it'll just drop on the floor, but this pulls in pretty good. That's the strength of the magnet. Now, if you ever need to rotate this, we would always like to see the 007 where it's readable. If you, so if you're installing this in this orientation, there's four Allen heads. Take those four Allen heads out. Don't pull the motor off the body. Just rotate the motor till it's in this position where you can read it. Put your Allens back in and you're ready to go again. And the reason we say that is there's a rubber O-ring right here. And that rubber O-ring is captured inside of the body. And if you pull that motor out, you may have a difficult time getting that rubber O-ring back into the housing. So if you need to rotate it, I don't want to kill this, but I want to make sure nobody has a problem six o'clock at night. Pull these out, pull the four Allen keys out, just rotate your motor while the O-ring is still in, in the housing, and then put your Allen keys back in and you're ready to go. Uh, behind this cover, we have a uh, pull away and there's about six inches of wire and you can wire top or bottom with your connector. Very easy to get to. All of the circulators, except the OEM version, comes with an integral check valve. Okay, so when the water flows through, it pushes a check valve open. Each circulator flange is set that the outlet side the outlet side. So there's an arrow here on the uh, circulator right here. The arrow is facing up. I would take the O-ring, put the O-ring in first, and then push that in. That's an installed IFC. When the circulator comes on, it will lift the internal flow check and it will circulate water throughout the system. So that's how they install. That part is available if you're doing a lot of OEM product and you want to put an integral flow check in there, that product, that little flow check is available. So on the uh, circulator here, there's the eye of the circulator. That's what it looks like when we pull it apart. Again, that is the black iron oxide barrier right there. It does not have to be changed. It's not a filter. Uh, we always get those questions asked. It's going to stay in the circulator. Um, normally. When you fill this, it's full. It, the water stays in the circulator. The only time the water will come out of the circulator is if you drain the system and refill the system, it will refill the, the cartridge area. So this is our 007E. This is an LED light. And I'm gonna ask Eric to assist here for a second. I know he's got his hands full. He's gonna zoom in here and then he's gonna hop out of his chair for me. And what will happen here is this is going to do a couple of things. This is going to be orange when it's in operation mode. This circulator has the ability to recognize if it's airbound. If the circulator goes to spin and it feels no resistance, it knows it's airbound. It will take and ramp the RPM up to 6,000 RPM and back down up to 100 times. And then if it can't move the air pocket, it will turn red and let you know that the circulator has shut off for a reason. You can go there, purge out the heat circuit, power the circulator down, power it back up, the circulator is good, it will run again. Where an AC circulator will sit there and burn itself out. The other function that this has built in is if it were stuck, it knows when it's supposed to be rotating, but if it wasn't rotating, it has the ability to rotate 
back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and shake the impeller back and forth to try to break any debris loose that might be on the uh, inside the circulator, seizing it up. So each time it does that, this LED light will flash white. So Eric's going to plug it in, and you can see it flashing orange, so it's running. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to just take and stop it. You'll, you'll see it here. It'll flash white, and it's buzzing in my hand trying to move. I'll grab it, and you can watch my hand shake here in a second. Hopefully you can hear that as it's burning the skin off of my hand, trying to move itself. Okay, that's what the circulator will do. And the whole time it's doing that, it'll be flashing and it'll be flashing white. I don't have my hand on it right now, but it's recognizing that there's no resistance. So it's flashing white. It's trying to purge the air out. All right, and if it were if we left this on, it would eventually go to red. I don't want to burn it out, so I'm going to have Eric unplug it. I don't want to burn the circulator out, but this will all go on at the home. You may not even have to be there. Um, this will save you a service call over the life of that circulator. So whether it's a 0070, the 0015 E3, um, they all have this sure start and air purge function built in. So. If you would like to save a service call over the life of a boiler install, um, don't hesitate. The e-circulators are very robust. They've been very good for us for the last five years, and uh, we're seeing more and more of them go out the door every day. Any questions, Jim? Um, I have a high achiever who's asking some advanced questions that we're going to get into as we go forward. Okay, good. So we don't have to hit them. Right. So All right. We got three minutes left. Uh, we're at the last slide. So if no one has questions, we appreciate everybody tuning in. Um, please go to HVA Insiders and uh, just join up. We're not going to blast you out bogus emails or spam or anything like that. That's just uh, that's a landing page for us to. We put all of our training videos up there. Um, we get a lot of correspondence back and forth. We do some podcasts on that site. So um, come be a part of the team. Join that HVAC Insiders. And uh, if there's no questions from Jim, we'll see you back here next Tuesday morning at 7 a.m. Don't forget to look for your downloads. Uh, Cristiano will be sending those out. Uh, you'll have them on Monday. Get those printed. They'll probably... As we go forward here, there's gonna be a couple more pages out of the Keiko catalog that you're gonna to need to print out. So if you uh, wanna get ahead of the curve, um, I'll give you a couple of page numbers right now that you'll need uh, later on. You'll need page 52, you'll need page 50, and you'll need page 48. 48, 50, and 52 if you wanna get ahead of the curve would with your printouts, uh, you'll need those over weeks two, three, and four. So um, we're good, Jim? Yes, yeah, somebody wanna know, will there be a recording of this? There will be a recording of this. Um, you can go back and review it, usually within about four hours of us finishing. <clears throat> Our marketing IT staff here uh, gets it up on that HVAC Insider site. So again, that's that's really, that's a spot where we do a lot of communications. Um, if you're on Instagram, we, we got some Instagram stuff going on there, Facebook, LinkedIn, you name it. Um, Eric is uh, in tune with all that. I am not, but uh, Eric is in tune and Chris is in tune with all of that. So uh, definitely a lot of information we put out onto the HVACinsiders.com uh, site. So uh, look forward to seeing everybody next week and thank you for your participation.